Welcome back to our Daily Thunder series on Victorious Living, and I have been so enjoying this series. It's been such a refreshment to my soul to just take a a look at what real Christianity looks like and just that amazing calling that God has put on each of us to radically follow Him, to not pitch our tent in the land of mediocrity. In this session, we're going to be talking about what it means to step out of our comfort zone. And just as a review, in the last session, we were going to talk about three practical ways to go after more, to not pitch our tent, but to say, Lord, I want to follow you wherever you lead. I want to have that heart of radical devotion to you. And our first practical way was to pursue Jesus first, to put him as a higher priority than anything else in our lives. And that's what we talked about in the last session. In this session, I'd like to talk about removing our safety cones because it's another very practical way to go after that victorious vision that God has for us. Now, what do I mean by safety cones? We all have those areas of our lives that we've kind of put safety cones around where we secretly inwardly say, Lord, I'll go this far, but no farther. And it's just kind of our natural human tendency to kind of put limits or put boundaries around what God can do, especially in certain areas of our lives. And God is always working with me to challenge me to step out of my comfort zone and to not pitch my tent. In fact, I never would have guessed earlier in my life that God would call me to speak or to teach or to be in front of people because that was not my comfort zone. And there was a whole process God had to walk me through where I removed those safety cones and said, Lord, I don't feel competent or capable of doing this, but if you are calling me to this, I'll take up those safety cones and you can do this through me. I remember a time when we had... Hudson and Harper, our two oldest, they were very little. Hudson was like three and a half and Harper had just come home from Korea. So two really small children. We had walked through Harper's adoption from Korea and it had been this beautiful, just spiritually rich process and just God breaking our hearts for the orphans around the world and just working in our lives to say yes to bring them in, bring some of them into our home. But it was kind of like just we had walked through that and then we were comfortable again. And God was saying, you know, I don't want you to pitch your tent. And it was actually through Hudson, who was three and a half at, at the time, that God challenged us to remove safety cones. We had a friend who had gone to visit Haiti, and she had taken pictures of children in orphanages that needed to be adopted. And the they had brought her there so that she could hopefully capture just the beauty of these children and, and maybe match them up with families or show them to families that were looking to adopt so that they could say, oh, you know, this is the child I feel drawn to, and just give them the opportunity to be adopted. So that's why she was there taking pictures. And she was showing us some of these pictures, and they were all – really hard to see because they were children who had been very neglected. A lot of them were sick. They were in a really difficult living situation. And Hudson was looking at the pictures and he said in his little three-year-old way, who those kids? Why they sad? And we said, well, Hudson, those those are orphans. And he said, what's an orphan? And we said, those are children who don't have a mommy and a daddy to take care of them. And he really thought about that. It hit him at a really deep level even as a three-year-old, and he thought about it for a while. And then it was maybe a day or two later that he said, you know what? If we bring those children into our family, they won't be orphans anymore. And Eric and I, when we heard that, we were pretty convicted, like, wow, that's true. God, that's how God works. He sets the solitary in families. And we had seen him do that in the adoption of Harper. But God was starting to stir more in our family with regards to adoption. And Hudson made a proposal to us. And he said, I think we need to go to Haiti and bring home 20 children. This was his three and a half year old vision for what he wanted to do. And he thought, you know, I have a perfectly good home and a perfectly good mommy and daddy. Let's just share what I have with those kids who need a home. And what a beautiful childlike response to the orphan crisis. But we were thinking, well, that's not realistic, and we just got done with an adoption, so how are we going to tell our three-year-old that his idea isn't going to work? So I remember telling him, you know, we just don't have room in our house for 20 children. He thought about this problem for a while, and a day or two later, he came and he got us, and he said, I want you to come upstairs and see something. And we came up the stairs, and all over the upstairs, in his room, in the hall, in the bathroom, in Harper's room, in our room, were orphan beds. He had made a blanket, a pillow, put one of his stuffed animals, and he said, 
We do have room. Look at all these places where these orphans could sleep. And he had taken the biggest burden on himself. The large majority of the orphan beds were in his room, and he was sharing his best toys. Now, he was the first grandchild on both sides of the family when he was born. So, of course, he had loads of toys and stuffed animals, and he was sharing them with these imaginary orphans that were going to come into our family. And he said, see, we do have room. And Eric and I were just so speechless to realize that God, through this little three-and-a-half-year-old childlike heart, was saying, will you remove your safety cones? Do you know that I have more for you in this area of adoption? And that led to the adoption of three more children. I remember God calling us to remove safety cones in the area of sleep. We can be very protective of our sleep, especially when we have young children or we have a a heavy schedule, heavy workload. And there were times that God called Eric and I to stay up half the night or most of the night just to wrestle in prayer. Were we willing to give up sleep in order to do that? And it was really challenging at first, but as we removed those safety cones, we realized that he was giving us supernatural grace and energy for anything that he had called us to do the next day. Now, that wasn't something he called us to every night, but one of the things I looked back on and said, wow, that that was so perfectly timed because it was right before we stepped into Ellerslie, our discipleship ministry, and the demands upon us, the demands to lose sleep and be fully available and to stay up all night and pray with people were there. And if we hadn't trained, if God had and asked us to remove those safety cones, we wouldn't have been ready for that. So those are just two examples that I think back on of times that God's asked me to remove my safety cones, but it's kind of on a continual basis for any of us who have chosen to say, Lord, my life is yours. And so we need to be remembering that he is usually going to nudge us out of our comfort zone whenever we get comfortable. So I want you to prayerfully consider these steps of safety cone removal. Are you willing to remove the safety cone of silence? Meaning, can you share the gospel with others even if they reject you? And for us, a lot of us, that's a big one. We can we can kind of live out our Christianity, but we don't really want to speak about our Christianity. And that's a safety cone of silence. Are we willing for God to remove that if he does call us to share? Removing the safety cone of social correctness, standing boldly with Jesus in a hostile culture. That's a huge one because the pressure is more and more and more with every passing week and month. Are we willing to say, I'm standing boldly with Christ, even though the culture will will despise me and I will not seem sensitive and relevant to what's going on in the world by standing boldly with Jesus. Are we willing to remove the safety cone of unforgiveness? It's amazing how just holding on to offense can be a safety cone in our lives because we don't want to have to deal with the pain that they've caused us. So we just kind of hold on to it through bitterness or through unforgiveness. But learning how by the grace of God to love and forgive those who have hurt us can be a way of saying, Lord, yes, remove this safety cone and do that miracle in me. Removing the safety cone of self-protection, letting God take us out of our comfort zone to serve him even more boldly. That might be a life direction thing. That might be adoption. That might be evangelism. That might be serving the poor. But taking that active step to say, Lord, I want to build your kingdom, even if it gets me out of that bubble of self-protection. Removing the safety cone of comfort, embracing inconvenient steps of obedience and self-sacrifice. And that is not does not come natural for any of us, but there are times times when God is saying, you know, it doesn't really matter if this is comfortable for you. I'm calling you to this. Are you willing to say yes? And when I look at Christian history, I see men and women who basically said no to comfort and security to say yes to a life that was radically given to Christ. Are you willing to remove the safety cone of control, exchanging your dreams for his? And one thing you can know is that when you lay your dreams at his feet and you take up his dreams for your life, your life will be more fulfilled and more beautiful than anything you ever could dream for yourself. But a lot of us cling to those dreams that we've always had. And we think, I don't want to let those go. Are you willing to give them to Jesus and let him replace them with his dreams for your life? The martyrdom of John and Betty Stamm, I mentioned this in an earlier episode in this series, it inspired Christians around the world to remove their safety cones and their self-protection. When this young couple was so willing to even give up their very lives to bring the gospel to China, so many other Christians said, 
I want to take up my safety cones and go no matter what the cost. Here's what one college student said. I do not fear death, but would be happy to die in China or here for Christ's cause. The chief desire would be that my death should be a means of leading precious souls to Christ. Being human, I naturally dread suffering and distress of the body and abuse at the hands of wicked men. But I really believe that I have faced all these possibilities and counted the cost. This tragic and terrible happening does not frighten me, but rather makes me regird myself with the armor of God. I love that because when we radically follow Jesus, whatever God does in our lives, even if it seems like a tragedy, inspires others to say, I'm removing my safety cones. I'm going after Jesus. Gladys Elward is is a missionary hero of mine, and she has so many instances in her life of removing safety cones. One of the earliest ones is when she was working as a parlor maid in England, and she had a vision to go to China as a missionary, but had no money. She she was scraping together every bit of money that she could earn, and she she had these very comfortable work shoes because she worked as a maid and was on her feet every day, but she saw an opportunity to sell those shoes. And so she went and sold those comfortable work shoes, put the money towards China and wore these two left shoes all the way until she went to China. And again, removing the safety cone of comfort right there to say, Lord, nothing's going to hold me back. If you're calling me to China, I will make any sacrifice to get there. If you study her life, there are so many other stories. One was that that really stands out to me is when she was in China, she was asked to stop a riot at a men's prison where they were killing each other. Now, she's this little short lady and just completely on her own. And they said, you have the power of God. You have the living God inside of you. So come stop this riot. And to get out of her comfort zone, I mean, I can't even imagine how many safety cones had to be removed for her to go into the midst of a riot where these huge men were killing each other and clubbing each other to death. And she's a short little lady with no support. And she just went in there in the strength of God and was able to stop stop that riot. She also led hundreds of children over a mountain pass to safety in the middle of a war. And again, totally outside of her comfort zone. But because of her willingness to remove her safety cones, she was so mightily used by God. There really wasn't anything extraordinary or special about her. She was simply willing to remove safety cones. And in fact, she herself said that. At the end of her life, she said, I wasn't God's first choice for what I've done for China. I don't know who it was. Maybe a man, a well-educated man. I don't know what happened. Maybe he died. Maybe he wasn't willing. And God looked down and saw Gladys Silward and said, well, she's willing. I love that. It's so encouraging because it shows us you don't have to be this super Christian in order to remove safety cones and let God work powerfully through you. Each one of us can ask God for that willingness. William Booth, who was the co-founder of the Salvation Army, he challenged Christians out of their comfort zones by saying words like these, not called, did you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful wail for help. Go stand by the gates of hell and hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house and bid their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. And then look Christ in the face whose mercy you have professed to obey and tell him whether you will join heart and soul and body and circumstances in the march to publish his mercy mercy to the world. I love that because we can't hide the, behind that excuse, oh, I'm just not called. I'm not called to a life of radical givenness to Christ. I'm not called to share the gospel with those around me. All of us are called. And, and William Booth is saying, if you think you're not called, it's just that you have not heard the call yet. If you really come face to face with what who Jesus is, what he's done for you and what he calls you to, you can't say no to that calling. We don't have a lot of excuses to keep up our safety codes when we hear stories like these and words like these. Here's the key truth. God is calling us, each of us, in such a time as this to say, Lord, take away my safety cones. Are we listening? The time is short. What are we living for? Are we living for this life or eternity? And there's that famous quote by C.T. Studd that just convicts me every time I hear it. Only one life, it will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When you think about the way you spend your time and what you invest into, how much of that is going to last for eternity? What our goal should be as Christians is that the highest percentage possible of what we're investing our time and energy and resource into would be things that last for eternity, not things that are just going to fade into nothing. Elizabeth Elliot said, purity comes at a high price. Sometimes the sacrifice makes little sense to others, but when offered to him, it is always accepted. And I believe the same principle applies to world-changing Christianity. That's a principle not just for purity, but for world-changing Christianity. 
Devotion to Jesus comes at a high price, forsaking everything to follow him. Sometimes the sacrifice makes little sense to others, but when offered to him, it is always accepted. Now, I want to give a side note here for busy moms. A lot of you probably are in a stage of life when you're very busy with your children, maybe you're homeschooling or you have a lot of little ones. It's easy to feel like this principle doesn't really apply to us as busy moms because of what we're already carrying. Radical devotion to Christ, though, can take a lot of different forms. God often asks us to step out of our comfort zone in our very own homes, especially when it comes to being willing to pour out our life for the sake of our children's salvation. And that is one that God is always bringing me back to. Like, how far are you willing to go? How much are you willing to pour out so that your children would each understand how to have a close, intimate, daily relationship with me. Here's something that R.A. Torrey said that I, I really found powerful. Mothers and fathers, it is your privilege to have every one of your children saved, but it costs something to have them saved. It costs your spending much time alone with God, to be much in prayer. It costs your making sacrifices and straighten out those things in your life that are wrong. It costs fulfilling the conditions of prevailing prayer. And that can be a statement that makes us bristle as parents, like, well, it's not really up to us. It's, you know, the child has to choose for themselves. That is true. But God has given us an incredible influence over the spiritual lives of our children. Are we willing to remove safety cones and go after their salvation at that level? And God will bless it when we have that kind of willingness. It's really powerful also to look through history and see how many of these great missionaries were impacted primarily because of the faithfulness and prayer of their parents. I think about Hudson Taylor's story. He was this kind of mediocre teenager who kind of drifted away from Christ at the age of 16 or 17, and even though he had been brought up in a Christian home. And his mother went away for a few days and she was so burdened for her young son, and she wanted to see him give his life fully to Jesus Christ, and she was visiting relatives. She shut herself in her room for three days and didn't come out. She just wrestled in prayer and wrestled in prayer and wrestled in prayer. And finally, when she got to a point where she felt like God had heard her prayer, what was happening in the Taylor home where, that she didn't know about is that right at that time, Hudson Taylor had stumbled upon a track in his father's study, read it, and it spoke to his heart. He fell on his knees and gave his life fully to Christ. And when she came home those few days later, he met her at the door and said, I have something to tell you. And she said, I already know you've given your life to Christ. That is so powerful. Are we willing to wrestle in prayer for our children's soul the way she was really willing to wrestle for him? And that poured out life, that radical devotion might be within our own families. So if you're a busy parent, just keep that in mind. Maybe God's asking you to remove safety cones in just your willingness to wrestle in prayer and go after the souls of your children. Removing the safety cone of busyness and distraction, this is a huge one, and wrestling in prayer for the salvation of our family, our friends, our loved ones. You know, safety cones can come in many different forms. And I think a lot of us get addicted to that sense of just being busy and distracted and on social media and doing things all of the time when God might be saying, take take those safety cones out of the way. That's comfortable for you, but I want you to wrestle in prayer. I want you to go after the souls around you spiritually and practically. Here's a key question that might be an interesting one for you to grapple with. Is it safe to remove our safety cones? I mean, you see these stories in Christian history or in scripture of people who remove safety cones and then they lost their lives for the glory of God or they lost family members. They, they, they lost something that was very valuable to them. Is it really safe to remove our safety cones for Christ's sake? Corrie Ten Boom talks about how she always prayed to God during as the war was starting and as the Nazis were invading her country and starting to persecute the Jews. She said, Lord, I'll, I'll do anything for you. I'll make myself fully available on behalf of your people to rescue them. You can do anything with me, but just don't send me to Germany. Because she knew going to Germany to a concentration camp was not safe. It would not be comfortable. And yet God said, no to that prayer. He allowed her to go into Germany and have her worst fear realized. And yet it was because of what he did in her life in that time and the loss that she experienced and the spiritual lessons that she learned that God used her powerfully all around the world for the rest of her life because people actually could relate to her pain and her story and her struggle because of what she went through. This is something that she wrote about it near the end of her life. Looking back across the years of her life, of my life, I can see the working of a divine pattern, which is the way of God with his children. When I was 
in a prison camp in Holland during the war, I often prayed, Lord, never let the enemy put me in a German concentration camp. God answered no to that prayer. Yet in the German camp with all its horror, I found many prisoners who had never heard of Jesus Christ. If God had not used my sister, my sister Betsy and me to bring them to him, they never would have heard of him. Many died or were killed, but many died with the name of Jesus on their lips. They were well worth all our suffering. Faith is like radar, which sees through the fog, the reality of things at a distance that the human eye cannot see. I love that perspective. That is what God does when we remove our safety cones. It doesn't mean that we won't go through suffering. It does mean that every bit of it will be used for our good and for the glory of God. Amy Carmichael talks about having to remove the safety cone of marriage. When she was a single missionary serving in Japan, she had this really big fear that God would call her to be single, and yet she removed those safety cones and said, Lord, if you've called me to a life of singleness, I trust you. And that was a really difficult step for her to take. She describes it this way. I went alone to a cave in a mountain called Arima in Japan. I felt many feelings of fear about the future. That's why I was there. I wanted to be alone with God. The devil kept on whispering, it's all right now, but what about after? words. You are going to be very lonely. And he painted pictures of loneliness. I can see them still. Then I turned to my God in a kind of desperation and said, Lord, what can I do? And he said, none of them that trusted me shall be desolate. That word has been with me ever since. It has been fulfilled to me. It will be fulfilled to you. Only live for him who redeemed you and trust him to take care of you. And he will. Now, again, those were words that she said at the end of her life, looking back to see the faithfulness of God as she removed her safety cones. And God did call her to a lifetime of singleness, but she never looked back on that with regret. God surrounded her with children that called her mother and women that called her sister and fulfilled every need that she had in her life. Both of these women had to face their greatest fear, yet as they removed safety cones and entrusted themselves fully to God, they found incredible peace and purpose in everything they walked through. So here's the key truth I'd like to close this session with. Whatever safety cones he asks us to remove, we must never forget that it is always safe to place our dreams, our future, and our life entirely in the nail-scarred hands of the one who died to save us. God bless.